Uh, yes, how can I uh, operate here? No. Check oh, this. Oh, and then? No. Just do it like this. This goes it. it should go ahead. Oh. This goes back. Okay. 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 There. Thank you. And you have to talk into the microphone. Yes, yes. Well, <clears throat> actually, uh, we have developed a composite index of well-being of the country, of the two sets of countries in CIS and European, East European countries. Uh, basically, the motivation of work in this area has come from the pioneering work which has been done by Andrew who happens to be my uh, discussant also, <laughs> thanks to Andrew. And the, uh, actually the basic objectives of my paper is this, to develop the well-being indexes of the two sets of countries by using the uh, Andrew's paper as benchmark. And then what we have tried to compare uh, the dynamics of well-being of the two sets of countries and then we have tried to examine the trajectories behind uh, uh, trained in well-being and finally we have tried to relate the globalization and well-being uh, in terms of a dynamic panel regression with GMM method. Anyway, our composite well-being index actually consists of present well-being index, future well-being index, and the social security index. Then, obviously, obviously there is there are, there is a lot of studies in this area, starting from the development of, uh, of the development of human development index, genuine progress index, human poverty index, a series of indexes on the qualities of life and well-being have been published. And of course, uh, there are limitations of almost all the studies. I'm not going into detail of the limitations, uh, which is given in the paper. And after taking into account of all those limitations, I have tried to present. Obviously, my paper will also have a series of limitations. Anyway, the methodology that we have followed is like this, that uh, while, uh, while computing the uh, well-being indexes, we have actually uh, group the countries uh, by following the United Nations Statistical Division's classification. And since the countries uh, like uh, Belarus, Moldova, Russia are, are contained in both sets, CIS and East European, and uh, I have incorporated these three into the East European uh, countries. Anyway, we have, while developing the uh, model, we have actually assumed two sorts of relationship between the individual components. One is the multiplicative relationship as because we have used geometric mean for computing the composite index. And another is the arithmetic, weighted arithmetic mean me method, giving 40% weight to present well-being, 30% to each of the two components. The overall well-being representative individual, we also assume that the overall well-being of a representative individual of a country will be the total well-being such that the individual is a risk averse and individual has got wide information about the market, the vector of goods which are available in the market. Anyway, we have expressed the indexes by using 1990 as base year. Our present oil being index is this, that is the, is consist of, you consist of actually the flow of real per capita consumption expenditure, flow of per capita government spending, less the per capita military expenditure, as we have taken into account the military expenditures in, in the social security index, and all this is adjusted with the life expectancy index as because the more healthy life creates 
some effect on the well-being of all alive in a country. And this method is also followed by Andrew. And the, the future well-being index is uh, actually consists of the uh, per capita savings in real term, per capita government savings, per capita stock of capital, net of depreciations, per capita human resource, which is measured in from the cost side, that is total expenditure on the uh, education, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and net contribution of the natural resources, which is net of the net of the environmental cost, such that the environmental cost is assumed to be 20 US dollar per ton of CO2 emission. And we have, sorry, what happened? No. Oh, sorry. And from the sum of this, we have deducted the per capita government debt in case of future well-being. And then the social security index actually consists of per capita domestic credit provided by the domestic financial institutions, the per capita military expenses, and the per capita social uh, contributions of the government. Thus, the composite well-being actually becomes like this, by the two methods. One is the first method is the GM method, and second is the weighted arithmetic method. Of, of course, you know that uh, whatever we desire in the database that the, the, the are not available as power, as power or requirement. So in that case, we since we have do, not have the longitudinal database for of all sets of parameters, we have got to approximate uh, by using the interpolation, extrapolation, and sometimes train methods, and etc. Now, um, look at the, the macro fundamentals of the economy, then it has followed that obviously the CIS countries have experienced lower levels of well-being of the people as compared to that of higher levels of well-being. Because you see GDP per capita is lower, the Guinea inequality in CI is, is higher, the gross domestic savings is lower, and, and uh, the, if you look at the human development index, the main human development index is also lower. Apart from this, if you look at the growth of real per capita GDP of the CIS countries, you see this is the trend of the uh, real per capita GDP of the CIS countries. And again, if you look at the trend in growth rates, then you see the CIS countries have experienced severe fluctuating pattern of growth of per capita GDP. And you see almost all the countries in the European, country, East European uh, section uh, sets have experienced increasing trend in well-being with, with uh, you see, with Czechoslovakia lies above the in level of per capita income. And in case of growth also, we also find the severe fluctuating trend in the growth of per capita GDP. Now, if you look at the trend in the well-being, individual well-being index sets, then we see that accepting the, the country Armenia in its CIS group has, has experienced continuous increasing trend, reaching the highest figure of uh, the 300, 338.66% increase. However, the, most of the other countries in CIS, excepting Ukraine, have experienced increasing present well-being since 2005 in some cases, and in some other cases it has occurred since 2010. Now, if, if we talk about the future well-being of the CIS countries, except in the countries Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, all other countries have experienced mild increasing trend in well-being. Now, as far as the social security index is concerned, the countries like Azerbaijan, Uzer, and Uzbekistan, and Ukraine, they will very miserable performance in respect of social security. Now, if you look at the composite overall well-being of the people for CIS countries, you can reveal a very miserable performance as for our, our result. And over the period, in East European countries, what you find that almost all the countries have experienced increasing trend in 
well-being, with Poland having higher increase in well-being followed by Hungary. However, we find wide in cross-country uh, variations in the levels of well-being, which is measured in terms of simply the standard division and the overall uh, aggregate figures are there, you see in the table. <clears throat> Oh, yes, only five minutes. No, okay, okay. Now, <clears throat> if if you look at the trend in comp uh, combined well-being of the CIS, CIS countries, that is, when uh, using GM, you see in the CIS countries, the Turkmenistan and the Kazakhstan have experienced higher levels of well-being, and every country, almost every country, has experienced the fluctuating pattern or cyclical behavior of the well-being. But in case of uh, uh, com composite well-being of East European countries, you see Poland actually is topping the list and other countries have also increased mild increasing trend in well-being. And then if we look at the long-run relationship between the uh, I have also tried to see the long-run relationship between the per capita uh, uh, GDP uh, index and the uh, composite well-being indexes. The figures are there. I, do it, I don't find any uniform relationship between the per capita GDP index and the composite well-being indexes. The results are, the diagrams are given at last. You see, these are the, uh, oh, oh, sorry. You see, in, uh, th this shows that sometimes what we find is this, sometimes the composite oil being lies below the uh, line of the uh, per capita GDP, and sometimes it lies above. This happens in almost all the countries in both CIS and uh, Europe, East European countries. You see, this is the picture. But what happens in Russia, uh, is, is really uh, astonishing on my part. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't explain it. Only three. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't, you see, there is a sudden jump of well-being since 2012. This is really, I, I, I couldn't explain it. And if, if you are anybody, if anybody is here, they, they can help me. I couldn't explain. Anyway. All the trains are given in the paper also. Now, let us see what we have had from our dynamic panel degradation analysis. What I found is this, uh, that, oh, sorry. What we find in case of CIS, both the globalization, we have actually, it must be mentioned that we have assumed a long-linear relationship between the globalization and the per capita GDP with the, where dependent variable is the CWBI. And I found that the globalization and PC GDP, per capita GDP, has explained uh, the, uh, the actually cost country and cost time variations in the uh, composite well-being, and these two factors have played a significant role. However, if we look at the East European countries, the, uh, the explanatory factors are significant, but they are at 10% level of significance. Anyway, but if we, if we uh, look at, if we introduce our own measure of globalization, that is nothing but the weighted sum of the trade uh, total value of trade by GDP and the uh, purpose, uh, FDI, net inflow of FDI, 80-20 weights. And in that case, we also find the role of the GI, that means the globalization index, has fallen to some extent. That's all. And then, let me go to the conclusion. What we have on the whole is that Almost all the countries in the two sets, CIS and EE, have experienced increasing pattern of well-being in varying degrees over time, albeit the starting point of rising uh, well-being differs from country to country. That's all.
Thank you so much for listening to me. Okay, thank you. Andrew Sharp, please. Okay, okay, great. Okay, okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to congratulate the author on producing an extremely ambitious uh, paper. Uh, it's really two papers in a sense. He has a large uh, section on the methodology of his index, and then he does econometric analysis. So I think it might be better, more effective as two, two papers. Uh, so I'm very honored that the author has chosen to use the Index of Economic Well-Being, which was developed by Lars Osberg and myself uh, two decades ago. And that index includes four components, uh, consumption flows, uh, stocks of wealth, which is the sustainability index, inequality, and also economic security. Now, we have various measures on that, but people can take whatever they think is the best approximation of that concept in their, uh, in their, in their region and develop an index. So we're, I'm very glad that you've used that framework. Um, I have a lot of, uh, of, of questions on the uh, paper. I'll go fairly quickly, then I, I, then I want to use, show some data uh, to make a few points. Um, first off, uh, the, the paper finds that globalization and GDP per capita have contributed greatly to well-being in both sets of countries, and that makes intuitive sense. So I overall agree with the conclusion that globalization and uh, economic growth contributes to well-being. That's pretty intuitive, but that's the key finding. Um, in terms of specific points, I think that you should uh, political definitions should trump um, the United Nations definitions of regions, and I really think you should include um, Russia, Moldova, and Belarus in CIS countries. If you want to have, I don't, I would just do it for CIS countries. Why bother with Eastern Europe? It's really the value added is CIS countries. So it looks very funny to have Russia as a not part of CIS. Uh, also, I think you should focus largely on trends over, uh, on the long-term trends over time and not bother as much with the cycles within. That's interesting, but you really have a long-term series there. And I would focus on who has done better over time and who hasn't. And I'll talk about that in the end with my slides. Now, in terms of, uh, of, of some of the points you raised, um, it wasn't quite clear why you don't have anything on inequality. You say that uh, in our index, we combine um, the Gini coefficient with a poverty measure to give an indication of inequality. And you, you say that vitiates having the two measures. Didn't quite clear there. So it's fine if you don't want to have the inequality dimension, but I think that is important uh, for well-being in many countries. Another one is on the CO2. Uh, it's not, not clear how that was integrated. Uh, $20 a ton uh, for the cost of greenhouse gas emissions is quite low. We've redone our numbers, and now we're using $100 a ton. So there's a big debate on what the social cost of CO2 emission is. We've also actually now put it in a stock, not a flow. And it wasn't clear if you were using it as a stock um, or a flow. Another key point is I didn't understand the rationale for including domestic credit as an indicator of social security. Uh, and there was no real discussion of why that is relevant to, to social security. Um, another question is you talk about military expenditure as, always, as a contributor to security. I guess you're meaning national security as opposed to individual security. But you could argue that, in, and sure, military expenditure obviously provides security uh, against uh, foreign aggressors, but also, but often, um, military expenditure can, can be used to suppress internal uh, uh, dissent. So it might not really, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider that a great measure of, of, of well-being. Um, also, in terms of the weighting, in the Index of Economic Well-Being, we use equal weights for our four domains. And you point out that maybe consumption is more important Current consumption is more important in the future. And actually, we've just done some surveys of audiences when we present our index, and we find that. So we probably should be, at least in terms of you look at what society values, it's current consumption over future. Now, whether that's good or not, but that's the preferences of many people. Now, the results were kind of interesting in terms of the econometrics. You show that a 1% increase in globalization uh, results in about a 0.2% increase in well-being in both uh, Eastern Europe and in the CIS countries. And then you're shown that a 1% increase in uh, GDP per capita uh, results in only about, about a 0.2% increase in well-being in Eastern Europe, but a 0.5% increase in CIS countries. So economic growth seems a lot more important 
in the CIS countries and in Eastern Europe. So it would be good if you'd expand on that. Is that because they have a lower level of development? Um, another key factor you don't really talk about is the issue of governance. And to what degree does governance, uh, of, uh, in terms of, let's say, corruption, affect the uh, economic well-being in, in many of these countries? Um, as a general rule, though, I think the key weakness of the paper, and this is to be understanding, given that you're not really an expert in these CIS countries, there's no narrative. If you really want to understand what's going on, you have to have some understanding of the developments in each country, and, that, and that's. So what you've done is just take international data and put it into your, uh, into your regressions, which is fine. But I think in terms of the paper, ultimately, you have to have an, uh, some understanding of what's going on in these countries to really understand. Now, in terms of uh, what I've done here, just to show... Um, okay. I've, uh, it, your paper sometimes is hard to um, under, see the trends, so what I thought I'd do is I would just repeat what you've done, and, but looking at the whole time series from 1990 to 2017 for the two sets of countries and for your four indicators. And the question I ask, do these results make sense? And I'm not an expert on these countries, so I, I don't really know or not, but I'll just go through them and people here in this room, who are many of them are from CIS countries, can say, do these results make sense? And I think many of you may find that they don't. Uh, now, for example, present well-being, and as I mentioned, that was a function of consumption, uh, um, government expenditure, subtracted military expenditures. And then we see here that Ukraine uh, is done the worst. These are compound growth rates, so you accumulate that over time. That's a major decline in, in well-being, uh, 6% a year for a uh, basically a 37-year uh, period. That's, so that may make sense because Ukraine has had a lot of problems. On the other hand, uh, Armenia is number one, followed by Kazakhstan. That may or may not make sense. Next, um, this is now the future well-being. Again, Ukraine is at the bottom, that may make sense. And Kazakhstan is at the top. Uh, then Tur Turkmenistan uh, does extremely well in terms of future well-being. Remember, this is, just, this is based on the, the domestic savings rate, uh, capital stock, human resources, uh, and natural resources. Um, the next one is social security. Uh, and this is only based on uh, domestic credit and military expenditures. Well, Turkmenistan is the big winner here, uh, which I guess kind of surprising given uh, the nature of the regime in Turkmenistan. And then Azerbaijan is the worst. Again, I, d I don't know. I would question whether those really, 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 really make, make sense in terms of what's going on. Then overall, in terms of the overall well-being in CIS countries, the big winner is Turkmenistan. Again, uh, not an intuitive result, I don't think. Ukraine as bottom, I think that makes a little bit more sense. And then when we turn to the European countries, uh, present well-being, well, Poland has done very well. Uh, and that, I think, makes sense there. Uh, Belarus is number two. And then Bulgaria is, does worse. Czech uh, also, although Czech Republic is considered a success story in many ways, so it's surprising it does so poorly uh, on that variable of consumption. Uh, then looking at the future, and again, uh, Poland does well, Hungary does well. I think that makes intuitive sense. Russia, uh, the worst for future well-being. And then so Social Security. Again, uh, Russia number one, um, I don't, I'm surprised by that. I, I, maybe that reflects your big jump in Russia, I guess, at the end. Poland uh, number two, makes more sense, I guess. And then the overall index, uh, Poland the big winner, I guess that makes sense. Uh, and that, 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 but I'm just saying um, I'd be interested in people's reaction to these numbers because I think you're going to um, have a lot of questions about why you chose particular variables to put into this index. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, okay, so are there questions, comments to the paper and also to the comments by Andrew, which were very interesting. Uh, if not, you uh, then you will yes. respond to Andrew's comments. Yeah? But you should talk into the microphone. Uh, hmm. I uh, agree with uh, Andrew in the sense that uh, I have included Russia in uh, East European countries, but I have simply followed the United Nations uh, statistical classifications, and that is why I have done it. And further, since European countries, East European countries, if we lead the three countries, Belarus, Moldova, and Russia, 
then East European countries, uh, the total sample size falls. And that was also a part of the reason to include all these things. Anyway, that is not, that cannot be at all. I know that anyway, I will try, uh, I, I will include Russia in my, while revising the paper, I have, uh, thanks uh, Andrew, that he has given a lot of comments and I try to revise all uh, the, my paper throughout paper uh, and include all the points. And second, obviously, inequality must be the case uh, while uh, taking into account. But in some papers, I have found that people are using both poverty intensity and inequality uh, at the same time. But in that case, one point is that both variables depends on per, uh, per capita income or income. So, Two variables con are taking are taken into consideration, uh, depending on only one uh, in variable income. That is, poverty is computed on the basis of income. That is, income poverty, and inequality is also computed on the basis of the distributions. And if you take the cumulative distribution and plot it in the graph, uh, then you will simply find the Gini coefficient also. So in both cases, we find the income is the single parameter to determine poverty and poverty ratio or intensity, whatever you say, and the uh, inequality. And second, obviously I do, I do agree with Andrew, uh, cost of environmental mitigation, I have taken it very low, and actually it was also used by Andrew in his paper in 2002, <laughs> and that's why I have used it. And I have got the data right now, while we are preparing my paper, I didn't have the data on this. Now I have got the data, uh, uh, cross-country data on environmental cost. Anyway, the uh, a domestic credit, I believe that uh, in almost all the countries, people build house and, uh, and uh, the tax flats and everything, apartment, by taking loans from the market, financial market. And in that case, uh, to some extent, I think that the domestic credit provider, domestic financial institution, gives some support uh, or some security to the people that they are getting and their credit and by mortgaging their house to the banks. Anyway, of course, the waiting process, this is simply arbitrary and I have given much more weight to the present consumption uh, because only because of the fact, if you talk, if you see the heterogeneous good theories, almost all the theories in the, the uh, you see the utility integral that, that they have used, they, are, they have used a constant parameter, constant parameter rho throughout. That means over the period rho will, same, how much the people at present will sacrifice for their future generation, for intergenerational transfer. In that case, I believe that people are much more concerned in present consumption than their future consumption as because the almost uh, throughout the world, globe, people are favoring nuclear family, only one son, and he will be educated and he will get a job and he will uh, be able to establish in the market uh, by, uh, in the competition also. Anyway, so waiting process is simply arbitrary and obviously governance is a major factor. In fact, I didn't have data on governance or rule of law while preparing this paper. And then, uh, Andrew told that in social security index, uh, only two components. No, it is not two. I have used the per capita social contribution that has been, uh, that is total expenditure of the government. And that obviously I believe, uh, as, as, uh, this is my assumption that also uh, it inc incorporates the unemployment insurance also, because this is nothing but the government transfers in the national income accounting. And in that case, uh, this this is an additional component which gives security, uh, social security to the people. And I think that's all I have covered all the points. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for giving me uh, a lot of comments and I will revise my paper. And thank you all. 